The hot bench judges are no strangers to conflict. Every week, the three-judge tribunal presides over small claims cases ranging from tame disputes over property damage to wild clashes over accusations of sabotage between longtime friends. Judges Michael Corriero, Rachel Juarez, and Yodit Tawald earned a wide variety of legal bona fides before joining the CBS series that hails from Judge Judy Scheinlin. Corriero served as a prosecutor in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, a criminal defense attorney, and a judge for 28 years. Juarez worked at big law firm Quinn Emanuel Urquhart and Sullivan Pryor to founding a family law practice specializing in the representation of high net worth individuals. And Tawald boasts extensive experience in criminal law from her years as an assistant district attorney in Dallas County and criminal defense attorney. The most recent episode of the series featured a woman suing a car shop owner for refusing to return new tires and rims she installed on the vehicle, which was repossessed. Ultimately, the judges ruled in favor of the defendant. It's hard for us to believe that you met your burden of proof, given your failure to produce in this courtroom receipts, just simple receipts that you paid the payments on time and that you paid them in full, said Corriero. Therefore, your case is dismissed. While no case is too small or too outlandish for the judges, they're also familiar with high-profile litigation and closely monitor matters in off-camera courtrooms. The panel sat down with The Hollywood Reporter for a wide-ranging conversation on Hollywood cases including Jonathan Major's conviction, Danny Masterson's chances on appeal and Alec Baldwin's potential criminal liability over the shooting on the set of Rust, and share why criminal procedurals like law and order are warping jurors' expectations. Whose lawyers in a high-profile civil or criminal case this year impressed you? Rachel Juarez One of the things that stood out to me this year was how in Gwyneth Paltrow's trial, she got what appeared to be some excellent legal advice to be herself when she testified. I think there was a general sense that the jury might not like Gwyneth Paltrow. They might see her as privileged. They might see her as unrelatable. Instead of trying to make herself relatable, or be something she wasn't, it seemed pretty clear that she was told to just be yourself. When it comes to credibility, I think that was huge because that was a case that depended on evaluating two different people's account of an event. I think the jury believed hers and, in part, that was because she came off as authentic, even if not perhaps relatable and truthful. Yoda Tawald, juries are perceptive. They can pick up on disingenuous energy. It doesn't matter if you won an Oscar or not. That's been tried before with celebrity cases where a celebrity who's an actor will go up on the stand and think that they can act their way into making a jury believe their version. It's just not going to work. Not when you have several of your peers watching every single thing that you're doing. You can't get away with it. What are your thoughts on Jonathan Major's conviction? Michael Corriero, I thought the verdict is a clear example of the jury's role as sacrosanct. There was an incredible amount of publicity from both sides on what happened and what didn't. The jury was able to cut through all of that and made some very crucial distinctions. For example, he was charged with intentional assault as the top count, intending to cause a physical injury of his accuser, and was found guilty of reckless assault. Meaning that the jury felt that whatever he did it was not intended to cause a physical injury. The jury really took the time to cut through both the prosecution's theory and defense theory to come up with a solution which they felt was fair just under the circumstances. Juarez, I agree with Michael. The jury really looked carefully at the charges and the evidence and carefully decided that the evidence matched one of the charges but not the others. Text messages from a previous alleged incident were shown to the jury and it seemed that Mr. Major's attorney opened the door to that on cross-examination. What are your thoughts on what happened there? And what impact do you think those texts had on the jury? Tawald, I think she opened the door, if I'm not mistaken, when she was cross-examining the accuser and was really pressing her on her vague answers to law enforcement. Well. Didn't you say this, but then you meant this, or why did you not say this? And the judge allowed the prosecution to provide more context for the jury as to why she was so vague. That's when the older text message came through about her not wanting to really tell the truth. Corriero, probably the worst thing a losing criminal defense lawyer would want to hear, and I was a criminal defense lawyer for seven years before I became a judge and after I left the prosecutor's office, is that you opened the door to incriminating evidence. So, I'm not going there because this question of the parameters of cross-examination goes directly to the skill level of an experienced trial lawyer. Sometimes we walk a razor's edge in cross-examination. This is a very delicate area, and I don't know how it played out. I wouldn't be comfortable in saying that she opened the door. It may very well have been part of her strategy to get it all out there. Juarez, I know the big takeaway was he was convicted on two of the counts, but he was also exonerated on two of the accounts. 
That would suggest that these text messages didn't so anger and offend the jury to the extent that they just threw the book at him. So, again, it's kind of hard to know if this opening the door type situation was deliberate. Did she know that these would probably come in but felt that the trade-off on cross-examination was worth it? Or perhaps it wasn't part of a broader strategy because the defense wasn't entirely unsuccessful. We can't ignore that. Danny Masterson's appeal is likely to focus, in part, on the introduction of uncharged bad acts witnesses and prosecutors being allowed to directly argue that he drugged his victims. What do you make of those arguments and what do you think his chances of success are? Juarez, there's going to be a lot of interesting issues on his appeal because you have the very unusual circumstance of a trial, a mistrial, and then a retrial where there were significantly different evidentiary decisions made by the judge. That's not particularly common. The notion of these bad acts and also the testimony and the evidence about Scientology, both of which were far more limited in the first trial and came into play in the second trial. For that reason, one could assume that they were a key reason for the difference in verdicts. It would be a decent assumption that they bore at least some weight on that. The evidence of the drugging of the victims, clearly that is prejudicial in the sense that it makes him look worse. But when you're evaluating these things, the question is unfair prejudice. Is it unfairly prejudicial? The evidence, as I understand it, is that he was drugging the victims in connection with the assaults. That type of evidence would seem to be closely related enough to the actual offenses that it would not be the type of unfairly prejudicial character testimony or uncharged prior bad act testimony. That would only paint them in a bad light and not shed any light in a probative and relevant sense.